All right. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Cleveland Skateboarding Storytellers podcast. I am your host, Christian Svitak, and this is my good friend here, the co-host for the day, Jay Croft. Hello, Christian. Hello, Jay. Nice seeing you here. I just want to start this off really quick of um, why uh, I have a co-host today. And it's because, you know, this first episode, I really thought that it was important for me to um, pretty much make the episode, I hate to say about me, but ultimately I just felt like the need that I need to, I need to explain who I am because there may be a lot of people out there watching or listening that have no idea who I am. They don't know my background. And also doing Cleveland skateboarding, whether it's the Instagram or now this podcast, I, I think a lot about the future. I think a lot about the kids that are just getting into skateboarding now, or maybe they're going to get into skateboarding long after we are all gone. And they just, they may not know, you know, who I was or anything. So I just felt like it was important to kind of dig into that just so if there's, you know, anybody out there just questioning, like, who, do, who is this guy? Who does he think he is, you know, doing this or whatever. And so anyways, I, I needed to make this first episode kind of geared all around that. And the idea of me sitting here in my office and just talking to a computer screen um, just didn't sit well with me. I'm, I'm not good at that. Um, I'm not a big selfie guy. I don't, I don't sit here and talk to computer screens. So I just thought it would be much more comfortable and natural if I reached out to my buddy Jay here and we could just have a conversation. He can ask me questions. And then that way I'd feel like I can talk and get all this out, you know, so much better. So, uh, with that being said, Jay here, um, old skateboarder, may be possibly the possibly the first skateboarder out of Norton, Ohio. Maybe, yes. 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 Um, some of you that follow the uh, the Cleveland skateboarding Instagram. Sorry, I'm pulling this up right now. I did a story on him. Jay, do you remember what number story that was? Hmm. I'm going to have it here in like two seconds. Okay. I did a story on Jay and it was story number. Where are you here? Oh, here you are. Uh, let's see here. Story number 18, okay. Jay Croft. Mm -hmm. So any of you out there that follow the Cleveland skateboarding Instagram, you can check out the whole little write up I did on him, but he is a very old friend that goes back decades out of Norton, Ohio, <clears throat> and um, really was just a part of our whole Cleveland Akron skate scene since, I mean, yeah. I think we first probably met like in the early mid nineties, something like that. Yeah. I think you and I first met probably roller world, I would think. Yeah. Parma area, maybe, maybe a little earlier than that, but yeah, it was probably the early to mid nineties when we started skating Cleveland a little bit more. And then I almost felt like you guys started coming down to Akron more as well. And everybody kind of started to mingle and coexist a little bit more. Yeah. So, At least you know, for our generation. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely for our generation. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, I think yeah. I skated Cleveland probably like, you know, you want to call the rolling bowl Cleveland and, you know, Berea, like, that was late eighties for sure. But like street skating downtown Cleveland was probably like 1990, 1989 was the first yeah. time we went up there, but not knowing any of you guys at that point. You know? Right. Well, at that point we were all little kids. I think I started skating right. downtown 88. I was 13, Right. but yep. you know, we were all little kids, but I think by the, by the time we were all out of our age range, all out of high school, like early, you know, 93, 92, 94, yep. that's when a lot of us started, um, I mean, I started skating Akron in 91 yep. in high school, like 16 years old, but I think it was once we were all out of high school and people can actually drive. And yep. that's when, you know, we started, obviously, Cleveland skaters, Akron skaters of our age started meeting each other. And right. yeah, so. Yeah, yeah that, that, you're right. 
So anyways, long story short, Jay's been around a very, very long time. So, um, well, let's get into it, um, okay. you know, and we can uh, just kind of, I can answer some of these questions so people can yeah, get, I mean, in, get an idea where I'm coming from. So when you asked me to do this, you know, you, you, you and I were talking a little while ago and you were like, I want to do this, you know, and I kept saying like, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, don't, don't be worried about it and just be stoked on what you're trying to do because I think that it's incredibly important to capture any skateboarding history, let alone like where we're from. And I think there's always been a very rich and deep skateboarding history in this area. And that's the, you know, along with a bunch of other things, but that's the great thing about Cleveland skateboarding. The thing that you're doing is actually, it, it's actually sharing those stories with everybody and you not wanting to talk about yourself would be a disservice to what you're trying to do. So I think this is highly important that we're getting the Christians VTech story out here. And this is the beginning of this phase of Cleveland skateboarding. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm excited. So it was, again, I was kind of thinking of some things to ask you and, you know, you and I have talked about some other things and um, I think, I think the thing that I really want to ask you first, what's your earliest memory of skateboarding? Man, my earliest memory, I, you know, I don't really know, but I know when I was, I feel like when I was around 10 or 11 is when there was something about a skateboard that was appealing to me. I didn't know there was a subculture. So I kind of separate out. Like when I tell people I started skating when I was 13 in 1988, what I mean by that is that's when I actually like entered the subculture. I found out I got into punk rock music and Thrasher magazine and I saw that there were pro skaters. But before that, maybe like around age 10 is when I, I, I was seeing kids like riding around on Volterras and Nashes and there was just something about it that just seemed so wild and different and i i didn't understand it and i rode around on a series of different generic boards you know a nash my cousin let me borrow a couple here or there i pulled one out of a an old voltaire out of a neighbor's trash can once but i didn't know there were tricks or anything like that right, right. um just that it was just something neat and i used to have a shirt when i was like 10 or 11 years old that said like it was like this alley cat with a skateboard on it Maybe it said Alley Cat on it. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was cool, you right. know? Yeah. Um, so I would say around that age is when there was just something going on. That's something that just clicked. So it wasn't like, I think a lot of people know your history with like Team Insanity and all of that. It wasn't one of those guys. It was actually this predates Team Insanity. Yeah. Story. That, yeah. Because you're asking of my first memories of it that yeah, predates yeah. team insanity it okay. wasn't until july 2nd 1988 right. that i was up at garfield home days carrying my volterra skateboard that i pulled out of my neighbor's tra trash can i was carrying that under my arm um and maybe a few weeks prior i went to my mom took me to her hair salon and i cut my mullet off i got my mullet cut off and I, I, there was a picture of a, I had like a BMX magazine and there was a picture of this BMXer with like that, the eighties, they, everyone calls it the Tony Hawk haircut, you know, the bangs and the shaved head. Yes. Yes. I didn't know people call it the McSqueeb and Tony Hawk. I didn't know who Tony, Wa ha sorry. I didn't know who Tony Hawk was at the time. I didn't right. know they were even pro skateboarders. I just saw that there was this BMXer with this wild haircut maybe he was from California, something about that, like seemed wild and, uh, you know, to me, exotic to me. Yeah. So mullet got cut off. The, the, the bangs came in with the shaved head on the side. Yeah. And I had this Volterra under my arm. And, and that day when I was walking through home days, that's what the team insanity guys were sitting on the, the picnic table. And, uh, they called me over to the table because they were like, whoa, like, who's that? You know, you didn't see skaters around that much back in the 80s. Right. They called me over to their picnic table. And then that's when it all 
kicked off for me. Were, were those guys all from Garfield? Like, were they from that area or were they from Team Insanity <clears throat> all over Cleveland? No. So one was from Garfield and that's the one that he recognized me because he, he that? knew tell, his name. What? Tell me their names. Stan Traska. Okay. And he doesn't skate anymore. I think he probably quit skating that summer, but he was like maybe my brother's age, like five years older. And he, he recognized me. I was, he, you know, saw that, you know, I was my, my brother's little brother. Right. So he called me over. The rest of the guys were from Cleveland proper, Southeast side, Warner road. So Garfield Heights, I'm from Garfield Heights, Garfield Heights butts right up to the Southeast side of Cleveland. Right. I always say it's kind of like the, the forgotten side of Cleveland. Like it, I think if anybody that's grown up in Cleveland knows it's always like West side or East side, but I come from the Southeast side, you know, like Slavic village brought, you know, Broadway, 93rd miles where all that comes together. <clears throat> and there's a road that comes off there, Warner road. And um, I think Warner road was always a pretty notorious, like old, might've been like an old hell's angels neighborhood. It was real, like back when I was a kid, it was a real big, like biker right. uh, neighborhood. So all the other guys on Team Insanity, they came from Warner Road. Okay. All right. Cle Cleveland City Limits. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you think, because this was actually one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you. So it's kind of, we're talking about it now. How did Garfield Heights and that area, the Southeast corner of Cleveland, how did that shape your skateboarding in those early years? Oh man, I looking back on it now, I realize how um, fortunate I was to grow up there because right down my parents' street is Garfield Boulevard, yep. businesses, post office. So anytime you have businesses and all that stuff on a main road, there's all kinds of obstacles to skate. Yep. Then you go up Garfield Boulevard and you have the main road, which is Turney Road, which goes all the way. It runs into like, you know, pretty much Warner Road and Broadway on one end in Cleveland. Yep. And then the, and then the other end, I mean, really it'll go all the way to Bedford, but um, that stretch through Garfield Heights is just businesses all the way down both sides. So, and, and then on top of that, we had a really killer industrial park hidden back in Garfield Heights with killer spots. So, so right out of the door, I could push all day long. So it wasn't until I was older, I realized I met a lot of friends that didn't have anything for miles to skate, you know, but we had handrails, we had double-sided curbs, we had guardrails, we had banks, we had parking blocks, we had a ton. So that extremely shaped the way street skater, uh, I street skating right out the door. Right. Yep. And then from there, you can catch the RTA either at, at the bottom of my parents' street or up on Turney Road. And the RTA would take you right down Broadway and drop us off at public square. It's so easy. Yeah, easy. No, it's amazing. And I, cause I've always wondered that about people again, you know, people from all over. I know people from all over and I always think it's fascinating to understand where they came from and how that shaped. Yes. Skateboarding. And like Northeastern Ohio, Ohio in general, like you said, a lot of it, there's a lot of rural areas yeah. that, that like a lot of amazing skateboarders came out of. And you think yeah. like, how in the world did those dudes get so good just skating their driveway or how did right. they, you know, like, and so again, you had, you had Cleveland at your doorstep, you know? Oh I, yeah. I, I think of, I think of like Mike V's part in like public domain and how he's sitting in that chair and he's like, you know, they come in and like, so you want to go skateboarding? And then he like throws it, you know, he slides a handrail caveman out, his, out of his door and then it's on. And like, yeah. I didn't have that where I grew up skating, you know, yeah. I, mean, I skated the local Acme, like that's yeah. all I had, you know, yeah. but to have that in your, your backyard, yeah. that's pretty yeah. pivotal, you know, I, I had that. Yeah. I was very lucky. The other thing I want to add on to it is how it shaped me as a skateboarder is, um, and I think a lot of people from that started skating in the eighties can relate to this to some extent, but to grow up where I did Garfield Heights is a very, it was a very blue collar, yeah. maybe lower middle class, you know, neighborhood. The steel mills aren't far away. Okay. Um, and there's, I, I couldn't even tell you, man. I think I counted one time there was like, I counted like 20 corner bars just 
Garfield Boulevard and Turney Road. Like there's bars everywhere, right? Yep. And and so, you know, Cleveland, uh, you know, it's a tough town. And especially back in the 80s, big steel town. We're butted right. I mean, Cleveland City Limits, I think, is like two stop signs down my parents' street. So Cleveland City Limits is right there, right? Okay. Yeah. And so Cleveland's it's the southeast side. The steel mills are right there. Slavic Village is around the corner. Um, that blue collar mentality. Let's just say, like, it's really you had you had to really want to be a skateboarder and a punk rocker back then yeah. because yeah. we got jumped all the time. Right. And when I moved to California in the '90s, and I told some of my friends about my experiences of growing up as a skater in Cleveland or Garfield Heights, they, they couldn't even believe it. No. They were like, what? Because they grew up skateboarding and surfing. It's like a part of the culture. Right. Yeah. But for us, it was like, Oh no, man. Like right. so right. different. Cause that, like I said, that's what really shaped you. And, and again, all the years you and I have known each other, you've always been that. Like I, I can see that's Christian from when he was a little kid all the way up to present day, still skating with you. I know that you're still that you hold that so true to you and so close, so close to your heart. And that has shaped your skateboarding. Again, it's more so than other people I've met, you know, and, and that's nothing against other people, but your skateboarding was shaped because of your environment for yeah, sure. Absolutely. 100%. And that's something that's cool that again, you're trying to show with this podcast or with Cleveland skateboarding Institute, like you're trying to show that, grittiness and that that edge that is this area it's unlike yeah. and you know you've been all over the world skating i've been all over the world skating. it's it's unlike any other place and ohio in general and this is a little side note too you know like has always had this huge huge skateboarding like population like mm -hmm. almost second to what california is it's always you think of California, then you think, well, where else is skateboarding popular? You could go on New York and that kind of stuff. But I think Ohio is right there, right at the top, because it's created people like you, you know? So mm. I just think yeah. it's a really interesting thing to understand. In understanding you, you have to understand Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. So, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for being so observant, Jay. <laughs> well, that's it's important to me, man. I, I find yeah. that this. It's always been important to me, man. As, as as soon as I, you know, made it on the map and made it in a magazine, I always wanted to carry, like, I've always just had Cleveland with me, like always trying to promote Cleveland. Yeah. yeah you you know? always did. And you, I mean, again, from somebody that was back here when you were doing that, like you did a good job at it and you always, you always shine the light right back to this area, you know, and I know I appreciated it and I know I can speak for everyone else. I know everybody else appreciated it as well. So good. You know, I just, well, I thanks. Think, and so again, you doing what you're doing now with Cleveland skateboarding, it's just, it's, it's basically what you've always done. You're just shining that light back on to just trying to figure out how to use a computer to get a bigger of, audience. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's good, man. You, this, this is awesome. So, um, well, okay. I mean, that was kind of the first thing that, you know, I wanted to talk about where you grew up and that kind of stuff, but you kind of answered some of my, uh, some of my questions, you know, um, and actually let me ask you this one too. This, this, I always think this is an important question. So if you could only skate one spot for the rest of your life in the Cleveland, Akron, Northeastern Ohio area, past or present, if it's, if it's a still skatable spot, what would that spot be? Because that I think has shaped your skateboarding as well. So. Without a doubt, it's the ID banks okay. in Garfield Heights. There's a little industrial park in Garfield Heights. I've I have I've had an ad in Thrasher magazine at that spot. I've I remember I did like a little video for like I don't know Fuel TV or something. Is that where you had all the boards but, laid out? Is that that no, one? No, it was like uh, oh, it was like there was a do tour in Cleveland, and they wanted to meet up with me and um show them like my 10 favorite spots in Cleveland. Okay. And like, I, I took them to that. I took the, like the film crew to that spot. But anyways, it's just as it's totally like crumbling away now, but it's just this blacktop bank that goes from, you know, flush all the way to like, I don't know, maybe five feet high. Um, now there's a guardrail at the top. There is, I think there's still a parking block that's been up there for the past like 20 years. 
Um, but it's the spot that we used to go to in the middle of the night. There'd be a whole bunch of us, but it's just the spot, man. Like I've been going there since I was 13. It's the spot. I have memories of every season skating there yeah. so back there by myself under the one street light or with a whole crew of like 20 of us and girls hanging out. And, um, but that's the spot. It, there's like a Korean church there now. It's, it's like this industrial building, but they turned it into a church. But, um, it's my one dream. I've always told my wife, I was like, if we ever came into like mega millions, mm -hmm. I would buy that building yes. and turn it into something killer. And I would repave that parking lot, line it with parking blocks at the top. Yes. That's it, man. Bank to curb. That's it. That's my spot. Okay, good. You should do a story on that, a post on that. That should I be, should. I, there should be a spot. I've, you know, that's another thing, man. I, th I've, that, I it, a lot of it comes down to time, but I've, I thought about that a lot. Like I need to start doing posts on like just spots, you know, right. so many iconic spots. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, okay. So, all right. So that leads me to my next question too. And that I'm, I, I have to talk Akron just because, yeah, I grew up in Norton, but I always, you know, have been around Akron and skating. But, yeah. Know, years and I know Akron like the back of my hand. So one of my and one of my memories of you is we pulled up to Central Howard like we always did. We parked up top and you could see down, you know, you could basically see all of Central. And so my buddy Brian and I get out of the car and we skate down. You know I used to kind of skate down to that. We get down yeah. and who's walking up? Here comes Christian all by himself. He's got his VHS camera. You're bloody as hell. And you're like, we're like, what? what's going on? What is happening? And you're like, look, and you showed us this video that you just recorded of you ollieing the chain and the wall. Oh, something. my God. And yeah. You, and, and you were like, yeah, I just did it. And we were like, holy, like, no, what? like what? And seriously, you were all bloody. Yeah. And then you, you were by yourself. You were with <laughs> nobody. And then you were like, I mean, and maybe somebody was there earlier. I don't know. I don't so know. someone filmed it. I don't, Chuck, I don't yes, remember. I don't Some, I yeah. But you were there by yourself, just walking up like ripped pants, like just, wow. and, huh. and then you were like, okay. And then we, we went skating downtown. Cause that, you know, central was always like the central meeting point. That's no the start. Point. Yeah. That's the start. And so then, you know, hit the Hills and whatnot, go bomb Hills. But so my question to you is this, what's your, what is your memory of Akron skateboarding? Like I, I have to shine a little light down here too. What's your main big memory besides probably that was a big moment in this area of ollieing the chain for sure. But what, well, what do you think of when you think of Akron, Ohio, like skateboarding? Man, I think of, uh, I think my most fond memories are just skating Central Howard. I skated Central Howard all year round, but the fall, there's something about the fall. Awesome. In fact, I was just with just skating with Chuck Sonito because I started going there because of him and the Solon guys. They were the ones that take me there. And I remember, I was like, remember the fall of 93? I mean, I started skating there in 91, but yes. I remember the fall of 93, like so vivid in my mind. It was like we were down at Central all the time and the leaves changing colors. And um, so anyways, I was telling Chuck just maybe yesterday, I was like, hey, man. This fall, we need to go to Akron a lot more. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, when I think of Akron, my favorite times, it's just like skating in the early 90s, early to mid 90s in the fall, just in general. That's it. Yeah, good. But yeah. to I, touch base on that, Ollie, I do not remember seeing you there. That's totally fine. I don't. But know. I remember Ollieing it. I, yeah. I, 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 the, yeah. I Ollied it twice. And the first time, I think that first time was 96. No. It, 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 96 or 97. Was it? Okay. Yeah. When did you ride for Invisible? Because that footage then was in the Invisible video. It, yeah, it was like in Caught Clean or something. Oh, or like, it was, clean, so it yeah, was something David like that. Video. Yep. I ollied it in, it was either 96 or 97. I almost want to say it was 96. Because I, I, I really feel like I was still flow for Invisible. And then I got on the team right at in December of 96. And then and I think it before, ended up. That was before you moved. You weren't even living in California. You no. were still living here. That was I was still here was fighting my way. Yeah. I was all in central Howard trying to like, prove, you know, prove it, make yeah. my mark. Right. 
Right. And so I remember awing it the first time and just that was bonkers in my mind. Someone was there. I had a friend there filming it, obviously. But I remember, you know, at the time, no one had done it. We all nope. talked about it. Everyone talked about I it. I remember being terrified. I remember getting served up a lot trying it. I did it. And I don't remember running into you. I think oh, everything went okay. blank after that. Well, the, but then again, I went. You were like shell shocked. That's what I'm saying. Like, you yeah, were, I was. And you were just like, you were haggard and blood yeah. and your pants were ripped. And you were just like, maybe what it, I, I don't know, maybe again, somebody filmed it, they left. And then you just sat there kind of soaking in the glory yeah. of, of ollieing the wall at central. Oh, and I like, was. <laughs> you just were like, because again, I, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I think that that, if you want to call it your career, Maybe that was the beginning of that. You took it up another level there. Am I okay? I mean, am I safe to say yeah, that? Yeah, for I sure. Think, I think that that's what kind of launched, no pun intended either, but that's kind of what launched you into where you wanted to go. Yeah. And I just think, again, it's Akron, Ohio. That's where I'm from. Like, you know, this is, that's huh. my territory. And like, I just think that that's really pivotal in your history. And I think people... If they don't know that story, they need to know that story. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, you know, what I want to add on to it is that, um, well, first off, you're right. I remember being just in complete shock. Like I, cause I remember us talking about like back in 1991, I remember us sitting at the top, like, you know, drinking sodas going, what if someone ollied the whole bank over the chain, no chain down. Like that's cheating, right? That's cheating. Over the brick flat part, over the chain to the bottom. We used to daydream about it. And then when I finally did it, 90, I think it was 96. Um, that sounds I, re right. I remember just being, yeah, I remember just thinking like, oh my God, like, I can't believe I did that. But yeah. then what people don't understand is I ollie that bank in label kills, totally. right? Yep. So I ollie the bank. The first footage you see of it is invisible video, 97 or something like that. Yep. But not many people saw it. And then I was filming for Label Kills in 2000. I'm already living, I'm in, living in California by now. I'm writing for Black Label. I'm pro for Black Label. Right. I was back visiting my parents and Dave Swift, photographer for Trans World, went on to the skateboard mag, been around forever. Sure. He was in town because his ex-wife was from Westlake, Stacy oh. Swift. Okay. And so uh, me and Dave got in touch and we're like, whoa, we're both in Cleveland at the same time. And so Dave was like, let's go shoot photos. So for, I'm like, okay, I have Dave Swift in Cleveland right now. What are we going to do? And I was like, I'm going to central. We're going to get a proper photo of central. Yes. Yes. So I went and did it again. Mike yes. Larkey filmed it. Yep. Yep. Mike Larkey filmed it. And I ollied it again. Um, in, in the year 2000, got the photo with Dave Swift that went on to be a spread in trans world. And then the footage from that ollie went into label kills. Right. See, so, that's what I'm yeah, saying. a lot of people don't realize it was like oh, it was right. two times that's, and four, yeah. like three, four years apart. Right. But that's <laughs> that's what I'm saying. The connection that you have with that spot, well, which a lot of us have with that spot is is huge. But that's that's the beginning. I mean, it's not the beginning, but it's the beginning of that level of where you're at, you know, and that. Right. You, that, again, it goes back to what we were talking. The first thing you were wanting to shine that light back on this area and what did, and you were like wait where am i gonna go oh i'm going to central or i'm gonna go do that like you're like no i'm gonna have this it's gonna be in label kills like this is this is a part of me this is ohio yeah, you know for sure i mean i can remember i remember going to the premiere and seeing it and just being like like there was a premiere here so west side yeah. or somebody yeah. or was a roll or something and it was like i think there was one downtown cleveland at a club or something like that yeah and it was like yes like I, yeah. Again, being from that area, skating, I mean, I could argue that that spot in its prime, it's me, it's not, it's past its prime now, was probably one of the best skate spots in the country. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. When the ledges, sure. when the ledges were perfect, like even when yeah. they were rounded still, there was not a bank like that. I mean, you no. could, there wasn't. And so yeah. th growing up there, again, that's shaped you into who you are today. So yeah, I just think it's really cool when you can find all that stuff. So yeah, well, thanks. It, it means a lot to me. Good. Yeah, it means, I think it means a lot 
to you. It means a lot to me. I think that spot means a lot to everybody mm -hmm. in this area. Like that was our, I might get, uh, that was our EMB. That was yeah. our Brooklyn banks. That was yeah. our, you know, that was the Midwest spot, you know, that yeah. people went to. So I just, you know, I think that's pretty awesome. So, um, okay. Well, so since we're talking about that now and in, with invisible, why don't you tell, so if people don't know, like talk about your sponsorship history and kind of where it did start. Was there ever, and I don't think, cause I know you rode for, you know, some skate shops around this area and whatnot, but was there ever any, was Schneider's one of your first spot? Did, did they ever sponsor you? Like what was your first, no. in this area, what was your first hookup besides team insanity and those dudes like giving you some love? The first, it was Garfield bike shop, Garfield bike shop. I've been going there since I was a kid. I mean, it's long gone now, but um, Jeff uh, sponsored me. I, I it was like the first skateboarder to probably ever ride for Garfield bike shop. Yes. I got like a little punch card and I got, you know, little discounts that was pretty much it, but it was awesome. I was super psyched on it. Um, that was maybe 94, you know, right out of high school. It was probably like 19 years old. And then... You remember the first thing he hooked you up with? I don't remember. I have all the boards. I mean, they're in my basement right now. I, I know them. I bought a lot of blanks because they were cheap. And then I can get the I can get my team rider discount. So it made it even cheaper. Yeah. Um, so from there, that didn't that only went on for a little bit because when West Side Skates opened, I believe that was ninety five. Nice. Um, it was opened by it. It was it was Jim Hill and Brian Jules. They right. both owned it, right. and so I had by that time I was skating with Jim Hill a lot. Um, I was skating with all the older like Cleveland guys a lot at that time, and so they opened West Side Skates. And it was Jim that all of a sudden one day just asked me, he goes, what's it going to take for you to be the first West side team rider? And I was like, well, what really? You know, like I thought he was just BSing me. Okay. And then uh, maybe a couple of days later I was in the shop and I was going to buy something. And Jim just turned to me and he goes, Hey man, go pick out a whole complete. What? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Jim. Yeah. He, he, and he like, I didn't want to do it. He like forced me. He's like, pick out a whole complete. I picked out a whole complete Jim hooked me up. I don't know how Brian felt about it, but Jim, Jim hooked me up and I was just, I was the first West side skates team rider. And I was always very, very proud of that. Yeah. Um, so that, and Jim Hill was one of my, I can't, he's going to be on this podcast, by the way. I mean, that guy's a champ. Yep. That guy has been like one of my biggest supporters over the years. I mean, uh, when I moved to California in 98, I remember again, like Jim pulled out three sets of Indies out of the cabinet and gave them to me. And he was like, you need to take these. You're, you're going to need trucks in California. Cause I didn't have a truck sponsor at that time. I was riding for invisible, but he was like, take these anyways, from there, um, in 95, I got flow for invisible skateboards out of Oceanside, California. You know, Did that's, you, just send, you send them a sponsor me tape. That's yeah. Awesome. So I worked downtown Cleveland um, so starting in 93, yeah, starting in 90, no, sorry. Starting in 94, when I was like just about turning nine, about 19 years old, that's when I bought a video camera. I started filming my, having my friends film me, edit it up. And then I would go to the post office in the Huntington bank basement, the post office. It's the windows are still there. It's all closed down though. But I used to go there with like a stack of VHS tapes in Manila, you know, the, the yellow envelopes ship them off to, I, I was just shipping them off to all these companies back then. Cause it was all these little companies in the early nineties. And I just figured at the time I was broke working full time, wasn't going to college. And really all I was looking for was maybe would someone would send me a free board. And that turned into Laban Fidius from invisible calling me and which, by the way, Invisible was a sister company to Blockhead Skateboards. So it was owned by Dave Bergethold, which is Blockhead and Invisible. We'll and so, later too. I, I want to finish. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so Laban called me up and he loved my video. And that sent me on to being on the Invisible Flow team, 95, 96. And I was just. Is that when they came through with the Winnebago? Remember yeah. Yeah. 
the Days of Plunder tour. They did a demo at Changa World. Yep, I, we were there. I was there. Yeah, I was still flow. Um, Laban had put me in one of his caught clean videos at that point. Four yeah. tricks, four or five tricks, and I was like blown away because that was the first video I was ever in that was a globally distributed video. This is before YouTube, right? This is when skateboarding videos. You know, I'm talking to the future kids right now. Right. Before computers, before all that, all you had is a VHS tape and a VCR. So you that was the first time I was ever on a global stage, right? Mm -hmm. By my five tricks and caught clean. And then he then they put a few tricks of me in that Days of Plunder tour video. Mm -hmm. right. Um, so I'm still just like banging away, trying to like get past just being a flow rider. And then I think it yeah, it was December ninety-six. Laban called me up and put me on the invisible am team. So like now I'm from there. I was like, they were giving me ads. They were flying me to California. They flew me out on a couple trips. I, I have to say this too. So I think your first ad, if memory serves me correct for invisible, was it, it was actually in downtown Akron. It's in episode. Akron. Another Akron photo. I know. And that's, I, I yeah. know that photo well. It's an awesome frontside 50, 50 down a skinny rail. Yeah. That, that rail is still there, by the way. Yeah, it's still just, there. Yeah. Uh, at the church, the brick yeah, church, yeah, yeah. downtown Akron, across and down the stairs. Across yeah, yep, yep. that was my, it was a spread, two-page spread in Trans World. So that was um, your first ad, though, in any skateboard match. Yeah, that was my first ad. Not I, my I, first photo. First photo was at Public good. Square in a Trans World Ohio article. Right, that Jeff and, Kula did. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, but that was my first ad. And then, so... From there, I realized if I wanted to try to take this any farther, I probably had to move to California and be closer to the team. So March of 98, I packed it up and I moved to Oceanside, California, uh, as still as an amateur. I worked at Invisible at the Climax Distribution Warehouse. I worked there. I lived there under a desk and um, we did some touring and then by the end of 98 invisible went out of business. So I almost was going to come back to Cleveland. I was like, okay, well, I guess this is done. That was a fun ride, right? I guess I'll move back to Cleveland and get my old printing job downtown on Chester and East ninth and carry on with life. But then I was skating with Aaron Harrison a lot at the time he rode for creature at the time. Mm -hmm. And he started talking to Jeff Kendall about getting me on creature. Oh, and no, no. I never yeah. And, oh. Yeah. And I, I talked to Kendall on the phone and it kind of seemed like that maybe, you know, I can't speak for him, but it seemed like maybe that's where it was going. Like I was going to end up on creature. Um, but then at the same time, that's when I met Mike Vallely, Matt Hensley. And then, you know, they put the good word in for, uh, to Lucero about me. I ended up talking to Lucero for hours on the phone. He saw my video, heard my story, got on black label um, sorry, I guess I'm walking you through my whole sponsor thing right now. I don't know if that's what you, I don't think that's no, what you that's, asked. No, that's, well, no, because I think it's, I think it's important. Although I do want to go, I want to ask just because everyone dreams of this pro skateboarder or the sponsored skateboarder life, rather, when you were out there, when you first moved to California, just tell me like, how did it feel? Like, what was that? What was that? Cause you, again, I know where you're from and I know, the dark days of winter and it's mm -hmm. like gnarly and you're skating at underground spots and you've got stocking hats on and long underwear and big gloves. And then you're out there and you're thinking like, what the hell? Like, this is amazing. Like, so yeah. what, what did that feel like? Just as a, as an Ohio kid. Like, um, two things. Number one, it felt amazing and it felt exciting because I was a I was a sponsored amateur with trans world across the street we had a skate park at climax. So all my favorite pros were coming to skate. Like I'd go skate with my favorite pros on lunch break. Um, it was amazing. At the same time, I had a really, a lot of really hard, lonely times. Um, I, you know, I, I had a girlfriend at the time from Ohio and she was going back and like leaving me and going back to mm -hmm. Cleveland and I'm out there by myself living under a desk at climax, listening to the rats run around in the, in the rafters. Um, this is before cell phones. This is before computers. So you're that, on your own. 
I was on my own and I'm, I was making $6 and 75 cents an hour running out of money, wondering, is this really worth it? Is it going to pan out? Um, so that I had some really hard, lonely times, especially I talked to, you know, talk to my buddies and they're all skating public square right. and I'm, and I'm just, I'm sitting in the warehouse listening to the rats running around just like, Oh my God, I wish I was with my buddies at public square right now, you know? Right. Um, so because that was, was that, was that a shock again, growing up where we grew up and the spots, the way they were, was it a little bit of a shock to your system? And did you long for those spots? Because California as you know, it's a, there's a different feel to the spots. Yeah. It's not really, there's not the opportunity to go out your door and push around or go meet mm. up at a central Howard or a public square. Right. It's like, was that a different, like, did your mind have to kind of switch a little bit? And yeah. Go, oh yeah. I hated it. I hated right. it. So as much, as much as it was magical and I'm doing all this cool stuff and skating with all these people and meeting friends and things are happening for me. Um, man, there was sometimes I'm just going skating around like this sucks, man. Like I, I really, I really hated it. Yeah. I and and I'm living in a beach town and I'm like this, I, it just wasn't clicking for me, man. Palm trees and the sunshine and the beach and the surfing, you know, I just, it was not my thing. It wasn't my thing. And I know that sounds like such a magical thing to a lot of people, but to me, it, it just, I felt out of my element. I, I didn't like it. You know, for a while I lived in Cardiff by the sea, which is a real affluent, uh, not that I was affluent at the time, I had a studio apartment, but a coastal beach town. And I just was like, where am I, man? Like, I don't, I didn't like it. I didn't, I just didn't like that whole culture. I wanted to be in downtown Cleveland skating with my buddies, finding spots around the steel mills, just, sure. you know, and well, so anyways, yeah. So I, I had like a, whatever. I, I don't know what you want to call it. Give and take push and pull. Well, what, so what made you stay though? Like again, so now we're back to where invisible was done. Okay. So invis on. like what, what made you stay then? Like why well, did you come back home? I was almost going to pack it up, but then the creature thing started. Oh, creature. I'm sorry. The creature thing, the creature thing was presenting itself to me, but then the black label thing presented itself to me. And I was a fan of black label since I was a kid, since it started since 16 years old. So then I got on Black Label um, October 1998, just a couple months after Invisible went out. And once that happened, it was like I was on the team with Mike Vallely, Matt Hensley, John Lucero, Jeff Grosso, Neil Hendricks, Tim Upson, Brian Sieber, Gagney, Jim Gagney, Jason Adams. Yep. I mean, I was like, even though I was am, I was like, oh man, like, this is it. Like I was, I was so happy. Right. So fast forward, I'm going to leave out a lot of details, but, um, fast forward, I get on. So I got on October 98 and by summer 99, I turned pro. Nice. So turned pro for black label. And then, so obviously from there, that's why I stayed. I mean, especially at that time in skateboarding, I had trans world at my fingertips. Mike Burnett is the, you know, head guy for Thrasher magazine. He becomes one of my best friends. I, I live by him. You got to be there I, at that time. At least I don't know how it is now, but at that time you had to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I built a whole life out there. I built a whole life and everything out there. Um, well, well, so, okay. So tell me now. So we're in the label story. T tell for the people that don't know, because I know, but tell tell the Black Ohio story then, and how that directly relates back to like with John being super into you know with Lurch and all those guys a long time ago. Yeah. And how when you got on the team, it was kind of like, oh, it's VTAC's great, like it's Ohio, like Black Ohio, like it all kind of came together in full circle yeah. for you. And well, that's yeah. Tell the story. Like, yeah. I mean, you pretty much just summed it up. It really goes back to John was really excited when I got on the team because I was from Cleveland. Um, now there is another skateboarder, Justin Ortiz, that did ride for Black Label in the early night, maybe 93, 94. He rode for Black Label for a very short period of time. I actually did a, there's a story on him on the Cleveland Skateboarding Instagram. <clears throat> you should check out. Um, but so John was really thrilled that I was from Cleveland because um 
back in the early nineties, John, John told me that if it weren't for shops like Schneider's bike shop and some others around Ohio, he would have been out of business for whatever reason. There has always been a huge support for black label in the state of Ohio and especially Cleveland. And a lot of that goes back to, you know, the, some of the guys you just mentioned, like, you know, Richie and uh, Richie Miller and um, all these guys would go from Cleveland out to Huntington beach and they would, you know, hang out with, I guess, like Ricky Barnes and Grosso and Lucero and all those guys. But going back to like, you know, the the 80s, right? The 80s are very early 90s. So those guys would come back to Cleveland and pretty much like tell Mr. Schneider, like, hey, you need to carry Lucero Limited. You need to carry Black Label. So the rest of the country may not have known what Black Label was at the time. But if you were a kid in Cleveland and you went to Schneider's Bike Shop, you knew. You, you know, knew what black label was, man. I had all the gear I've got right behind me. That was my, my first black label right there. That's yeah. That's yeah, a Grosso that's, right there. That's and the I've got two more thing. hanging over there. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the butthead. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, yeah, John was just so hyped on it, like all kind of coming together. And one day I went into his office and he had this printout of the black Ohio logo. He's like, Hey, check this out. And I was like, whoa. And I was still amateur at the time. So it wasn't my board graphic, but it kind of became like, it was kind of like my, my graphic, like he made boards and shirts and all that out of it. It was like, I'm not a pro, but it's kind of like my, my, my logo, but kind of shared with all the skaters of Ohio. You know what I mean? It was a big thank you to the skaters of Ohio but it was like this combined thing. Like it's kind of like my amateur graphic shared with all the skaters of Ohio. Yep. So that's kind of, no, that's, that's the amazing. story of it. Well, yeah. well and that, that's what I was saying earlier. That's just proves the point to me is that Ohio has always had this big, heavy skateboarding connection and that with California and that's, that's part of it. That's part of the, I mean, yeah. you could talk about the alien workshop and all that stuff too, but like, that's part of that, you know, and then yeah, you, were, for sure. you were a part of that. And like, I think that's important, but all yeah. right. So label was, let's label was for how many years? Uh, seven years, 98 to 2005. And then when that ended, I ended up starting my own skateboard company, which was called 1031 skateboards. I did that with my friend, uh, Mike out of beer city records and skateboards up in Milwaukee. A lot of people didn't know that fun fact, yep. but it was me and him. And we did 1031 skateboards for nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. We did that all the way up until January of 2000. And so it's from 2006, from January, 2006 to January of 2015. It's nine, it was nine years. Um, and then I was getting really burnt out on that. So from there, I, we shut down 1031 skateboards, um, and Mike Vallely, he's been one of my best friends since I got on black label in 98. He's the one that turned me pro and, you know, put the word into John for me at black label. Um, he was starting street plant. So actually he was starting street plant January, 2015, wanted me to be a part of it. I wanted to be a part of it. So I stopped doing 1031 because I was just over it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I started writing for street plant and Mike and I have been doing street plant since 2015, January, 2015, all the way until just a couple months ago. So it's been nine and a half years with street plant. Yep. And Mike now has decided he, he doesn't have the you know time and energy to do street plant anymore because he is now um, he's the lead singer for black flag. And that has turned into a massive massive operation for him constantly touring. And, um, so, he, you know, it just got to a point of, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do sales. I can't do graphics. I can't answer people's emails because he's driving the black flag van and then singing or, you know, performing every night and shaking a hundred hands every night and then getting in the van and doing it all over again. Right. So from there, um, this just happened uh, about a month or so ago that, you know, after street plant ended, I called up my old, one of my old best friends, taking me all the way back to the invisible days, Dave Bergethold, um, because again, invisible was blockhead skateboards, sister company. Right. Davis, uh, you know, he's, he's still doing blockhead. 
and with Laban and all the old guys, Sam Cunningham and, but even new additions like Chris Lambert, if anyone, you know, Chris Lambert going back to like expedition yeah. days and all that, yeah. he's on blockhead. So I called up Dave and I was like, Dave, you know, Dave's been one of my best friends. Dave and Laban have been like, they're family to me. You know, I, all these years I've been skating with those guys like daily, you know, and you know, whatever. So anyways, I, I called up Dave and I was like, you know, street plants over. You know, I was like, what do you, what do you think about me riding for blockhead? <laughs> you know? Yes. And so Dave was like, whoa, you know, anyways, everybody's super into it. And, um, so now I, as we speak right now, I ride for blockhead skateboards. Nice. We're, we're working on my new pro models to come out next spring. I'm working on a full video part. I'm going to drop when I turn 50 next year. Okay. Nice. Um, is and it a so Ron Cameron graphic, I have to ask, I was always, a, do you know who's doing the graphic? Or Ron Cameron. Ron Cam yes. Yeah. Okay. I went straight to him, man. I, I saw him at the video premiere and I told Dave too. I was like, Dave, if I'm on blockhead, man, I was like, I gotta have a, I gotta have a graphic by Ron Cameron, man. Yeah, of course. This has to be it's classic, right. you know? Yeah. So I've already been on the, I was actually on the phone with Ron for like an hour the other day, like discussing graphics and stuff. Oh, so okay, okay. yeah. So, yeah. The one's that coming out though? So everyone knows. Um, the board should be out spring 2015 or I'm sorry, 2025. Right. And we're trying to coincide it with this part I've been working on right. that's going to drop when I turn 50 in March, 2025. So I, I want to have it drop at some, some point while I'm 50 years old. So I don't know if it's going to be spring, summer, fall. I don't know. Right. Um, but that brings it full. That brings the whole, everything full circle for me because I started with Dave and Laban with invisible. They were the ones that gave me my shot back in 1995. Right. And now I'm right back. I'm back with those guys now in 2024. So it's pretty cool. Right. Well, I think it's awesome. And again, it's a, it's a cool history of, of skateboarding and the, the places you, the all, you know, through your whole sponsorship lineage, like it's, it's pretty amazing. So I just, as a, as a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, Garfield Heights, Ohio, like, I think that's pretty, you, d you did good. So, well, thanks. I'm yeah. shocked. Trust me, every step of the way. From the first time Laban called me, I was shocked. From getting sponsored as an am, I was shocked. Turning pro, I was shocked. And then even turning pro, you know, most pros' careers are done by the time they're 30, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought it would be over. And the fact that I'm pushing 50 now is, it's I'm crazy. shocked. I'm, I'm shocked. So I'm, I'm 50, so. All right, so I, I let me. I have one more question in this. This I think it'll kind of wrap this little section up. But mm -hmm. through all, okay, so almost being to fifty, what what does skateboarding mean to you? Like, does it mean the same thing that when you were a kid when you started as you are as a fifty year old man? Like, how do you look back at skating now? Like, what what is what about skateboarding is is the thing that makes you just go yes or like yes like that's it like what's the thing that you love about skateboarding so much well first off it is exactly the same thing for me as it was when i was a kid and i work i try very hard to keep it that way because once you become once you first off i don't even care if you're sponsored or not once you start become you know when you're a young man and you start getting your opinions and hearing your friends chirping in your ears of what they think is cool and then especially you go into your twenties and you think, you know, it all, and you have all these opinions of what it, things should be or shouldn't be, you know, you go through all that stuff. And then on top of it being so some, you know, I've been so submersed in the, in the skateboarding industry, being sponsored in pro and living in California, you get your, your head filled with even more craziness, right. From all kinds of outs, you know, noise, I call it noise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I went through that stuff, you know, like, oh, well, I think, I think this, I think that, but, um, many years, many, many, many years ago, I decided I need to work really hard to keep it exactly what it was, what it means to me. And, you know, for me, it's that, it's that, it's that man, it, it's, it's really hard to put into words, man, but it's, it's friendship. Mm -hmm. It's that freedom for me. It's like, it's, it's such an art to me. You could, people can laugh at that if they want, but it's not a sport to me, man. It's an art for me. I have so much going on in my head. I'm so influenced by music and skateboarding to me is the, my physical outlet to all the, 
all the, the, the music I listen to and the, all the ideas I have in my head, skateboarding is that physical outlet. Um, the creativity, um, I don't know. I'm, I have, I don't know why I have such a loss for words. I think about this kind of quite a bit, but, um, you know, I, I just give you an example, man. I, I would say 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago, I stopped looking at skateboarding magazines. I stopped following video. I just stopped following everything because Why? I, f because I found that my favorite times in skateboarding go back to when I was a kid and we got one video a year. I never had a subscription to a magazine. So I was clueless. And in my opinion, when I was a kid, if you were in a video or you were in a magazine, you were awesome because I wasn't right. Yeah. I was like, so to me back then as a kid, it was all like, it was just, everything was awesome. And I wanted to get back to that point. I spent too much, too many years sitting in vans with other people flipping through Thrasher magazine and making fun of different people in the mag and this and that. And I just, and hearing backstories on people, I didn't, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to be influenced by anything anymore. I wanted to get back to knowing very little and, but being stoked on all of it. Right. Right. Of course. Um, so, so yeah, so I, you know, I really like, I checked out, I still skateboard, skateboarded every single day. Right. As happy as can be, but I just checked out of all like the, the nitpicking. I, I didn't want to be influenced by, what was going on in the mags and advertisements and all the videos. And now with the internet, it's like, God, there's so much negativity in these chat rooms and I, whatever. I don't even skaters right. go on the internet and talk about things. It's just like they, they, they bash things. I don't mind if they talk about things, but just like all the negativity. Right. Just cut it out. I just cut it out. So for well, me, so when, it, was it, so when was that? I mean, was that kind of coincided when you, I know you're by coastal in a way, does that mm. kind of, coincide with when you kind of came back to this area again or is that a little later well when i started cutting everything out yes oh no i this i started doing that like 15 years ago oh, oh okay oh yeah, yeah i would get all the magazines mailed to me and it got to a point first i would i would look at to see who's on the cover and then i throw it away and then it got to a point where i would see it in my mailbox and i would grab it and pull it aside from the rest of my mail and purposely not look at it. And I throw it straight in the trash. What? I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know. Yeah. I, I wanted it. to live in my world of happiness and like just how it was when I was a kid. So then the one odd time where I do pick up a mag or whatever, I just want to be like, yeah, wow. Who is, it? I don't even know who these people are, you know? Super but when you get to like how far I've gone with things, it's like, you start knowing too much and, you want it's, to have a, you kind of, I guess maybe, is it the innocence of it really? Yeah. Yeah. It's the innocence of it. And also too, skateboarding. Another thing that skateboarding means a lot to me is it, it's hope. It gave me hope because I came from a neighborhood where, like I said, there are, there are bars on every corners. Um, no, nobody liked us because we were skateboarders and, and into punk music. So I got made fun of a lot. Um, I didn't, I wasn't a college bound kid. So um, I, I, I just might have been at one of those bars and that's it. You know? Yeah. I just felt like my future would be like working in the, not that there's anything wrong with working in the steel mills, but it was like, okay, I guess I'll just end up like in a factory or in the mills or whatever. But when I got into skateboarding and the music at the same time, for me, it was like, it was this avenue of like a bigger world, a bigger life, a chance to just do something. I didn't know what it was, but it's always given me that feeling of like, when I do this, I'm on some other track that nobody else understands or knows about. Right. I'm on this like secret road. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? Yours. It's yours and yours only. You know? yeah. 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 So I hope that answers your question. No, it does. No, I, it's, I, 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 again, I just think that's always fascinating to, to know really what makes skateboarding tick for people. You know? Yeah. What, what is the, what are the things you draw from it? Just, you know, skating is just, it's just such a simple act. Like I always say, like, as long as I can just push down the street, mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. Like if I, that's all I can do at the, at the end, when I'm 75 years old, that's all I want to do that to me, that's the essence of it. And yeah, that's, it's just this simple, beautiful thing. And I don't know. I just, I think it's always fascinating to hear people's 
Yeah, I, I can't agree more. For me, it's it's just being able to skate a city. I tell this, I have a friend out in California. I always try to, when I'm out there, I would always get her to try to come skate uh, downtown San Diego. Mm -hmm. And she can't really ollie. And she's always like, oh, but I can't, I can't skate it like you do. I can't ollie. I can't do tricks on these things. And I tell her, I'm like, skating the city is the trick. Totally. That's the trick. 100%. I was exactly. like, you don't have to ollie. I used to skate downtown Cleveland before I knew how to ollie. Totally. I just figured out how to, well, I guess I picked my board up going up some curbs, right? Yep. But it's all about, for me, pushing through the city, um, textures. I'm all about textures. You go from brick to asphalt to concrete to marble to granite, cracks, smooth, sewer, you know, sewer things, yep, right. sketchy people, cars, all of that. Yep. that's what it is. It's that adventure. And for me, skating like a, a, a big city, that's the trick. And that at the end of the day is I hope what all that, you know, if I can't do any other trick one day, I hope I can still put on some nice big soft wheels and push, and push. through a city, yep. preferably downtown Cleveland. That's my favorite. Right. <laughs> no, it, cause again, you're right. I think of that when skating Akron and downtown Cleveland too, there's, there's textures. I mean, I've skated New York. I, you know, I lived in Chicago for many years. There's just something about the way the asphalt and the concrete feels in this area to me. Yeah. And I think we could probably ask anybody that grew up in this area and they would probably say the same thing. Yeah. Like there's just this feeling of the ground, of the air, of the smells where you're yep. like, it just all encompasses. I mean, we're totally nerding out on it, but it's, it's all that. And maybe that's why you say too, because I really love the fall in this area. Mm -hmm. Like when like yeah. when you're skating in the fall in October, September, October, November, it doesn't get any better than that. Like that's that. why I had a skateboard company called 1031, I which most well. people don't know is the date of Halloween. Exactly. And I think any skateboarder from this area totally. knows and probably agrees, you know, fall is the most amazing time to skate back here. And Halloween is kind of like it's like the epicenter. It's like Totally. It's the, the marking point. And then after that, you know, winter's coming. You know? Exactly. So, right. Exactly. Anyways. All right. Well, okay. So let, why Cleveland skateboarding then? Like, tell me about that. Okay. Like, tell me where you're at. Like, what made you, when did you come up with this idea? Like what, what made you come up? What, was there a moment where you were like, yeah, oh, I well, need to bring that back, you know? Yeah. So I think it just goes, it was like three, four, I don't know how long I've been doing it now, a few years. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking like, man, I really I really want to start something new. My initial thoughts were, well, my brain immediately goes to like these global things, right? Like, oh, a brand. I want to start another, excuse me, a brand or a board brand, whatever. I've had my own board company before. I don't want to do that again. And, I, you know, nothing, I just have that creative spark in me. Like I wanted to do something. Well, I just started thinking like, you know, what do, what do I really like? Like, what am I, what am I really into? And I just keep thinking like, I, I really love Cleveland. Like I really love my friends. I grew up skating with in Cleveland, the history of it. Um, and then also I started thinking about discord records so I'm a big fan of Discord Records, Ian Mackay, Minor Threat, Fagazi, a record label he started many years ago. And as far as I understand, Discord Records is a it's a record label that many, many people love. Many bands want to be on that record label, but he only works with bands from Washington, D.C. And he's told bands, he goes, no, if, if you're not from D.C., you should go start a record label in your own hometown. Exactly. So I've always loved that idea of, yeah, that is so cool. He just is trying to help support music in Washington, D.C., his hometown where he is from. So I was like, I was thinking, all right, I want to do something Cleveland. But again, my head just keeps going, you know, brands. And and then I just realized, no, I, for some reason, I, I, I remember a lot of stories, you know, I know a lot of people, I've heard a lot of stories. I remember a lot of things and it seems like I remember a lot more than some of my friends remember. Mm -hmm. And I just realized when I it also too, I was thinking about how living in California for so many years, it's, 
I've heard so many times about Dogtown and Z-Boys. We have all heard about that a million times. We've heard all about the Bones Brigade. We've heard about everybody else's scene, you know, for decades now. Mm -hmm. But the one that has always meant the most to me is the one that I came from. Right. Me and my friends and everybody from the whole Northeast Ohio area, right? And when I say Cleveland skateboarding, it's not just Cleveland city limits. Anybody knows that scene has been so small at some points over the years. It's It includes anybody that kind of comes from anywhere in the surrounding area, but has just yep. kind of been amongst us. You know what I mean? Akron, yep. Youngstown sometimes, you know, Akron, Canton yeah. even. All, all of it, right. Right, yep. right. It's all one big kind of area. So anyways, I was just thinking, that's it. I need to, there were no cameras around back then. No one's going to make a documentary, but I know some stories. I know some people, I need to start documenting this. And I just realized, well, I have a super busy life. It's hard for me to really, I'm already taking on so many things in my life, but I can start an Instagram page. I can start talking to people get some photos and just get it out there. And that's how it started. Okay. Who was the first person that you did? So people can go back to the Instagram, you know, the first story I ever did was Schneider's bike shop. That's right. That's and the reason I did was because when I was daydreaming about it, I was making myself laugh. The first idea I had in my head was I was going to start an Instagram page called Cleveland skateboarding. And I was just going to get a portrait of Mr. Schneider. And I was just going to post it over and over and over and over and over with no words. Right. Just to amuse myself and to amuse right. my handful of friends that get it, you know, how, what an awesome, you know, guy that he, he is. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was the first. Story. So, but obviously I didn't do that. I went into a deep dive and did a story. Right. So wait, how many, you're how far into it now? What's the, I think, th I think three or four years. Let me look at let me look at the Instagram, Jay. Okay, um, the oldest post I have here goes back to Schneider's Bike Shop. Uh, that was August 13th, 2021. Wow. Okay. Wow. So almost almost three years. Well, 20, 22, 23. Yeah. Three years to the, oh to the God, making. Yeah. yeah, to yeah the three day, years. Guess, right? yeah. yeah. And also, too, people will notice I don't post much, right? Like maybe a post a month maybe one post every couple months Is and that that's on quality over quantity. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't, I, first off, I hate the internet. <laughs> I hate, no, really, man. I, I, I love seeing my friends on there, but for the most part, I just feel, I feel social media to me is it's such a toilet. I just, it just seems like people just wipe their rear end with it and just scroll on. It just doesn't have meaning. Right. Like back when we used to get a magazine once a month, that had a lot of meaning. It had a lot of weight and we held on to that. Yeah. Some of us still have these, I, we still have these magazines in our collections, right? Yeah. So I wanted this to be, I'm a, I want to, I want to shine a light on people that have been doing great things in the area with skateboarding. I don't want it to just be lost in a sea of garbage, right? Yeah. When I make a post, I put my full heart and thought into it. When I make a post, I want people to to take it serious, to think like, oh, this this is going to mean something. I'm going to stop and I'm going to read it. I'm going to absorb it. Not just like, oh, there's another post. Scroll on, scroll on, scroll, scroll, scroll. I right. I hate that. I hate right. it. Just so something, that has to be, something that's going to be a lasting story and that it'll, it makes an impact, you know. Yeah. It and an and on you to, to meet and talk to that person. And then hopefully that will make an impact on whoever's reading it, you know? Right. Like and, and I'm making a, I'm writing a story about someone and this, you know, people are very happy when I do that. It's yeah, important to them. It's important to me. So I want, I want the, the, the reader to stop, to stop the scroll and read it and acknowledge that this isn't just another piece of toilet paper that I'm putting out on the internet. Right. You know what well, I mean? So, okay. So then why, why a podcast then? Like what, what was that just the logical step to the next level or what made you think of that? Like where because, we're because so when I do a post on somebody on Instagram, I end up talking to, I end up talking to some people for hours. I hear the most amazing stories and I realize that 
I can never fit all of that into one Instagram post. And I always think to myself, man, I wish everybody can hear this right now because the stories I'm hearing right now are amazing, right? So there's that. I realized that a long time ago that I need to get, people need to hear these stories more so than just just what I'm writing on Instagram. And on top of it, um, a lot of people hit me up saying, hey, you need to do a story on so-and-so or do a story on this guy or that person. Sometimes it's hard for me. I want to do a story on everybody, right? Yeah, of course. But sometimes it's hard to find the story. You know what I mean? And I, I, I want to, you know, first try to focus on certain people that are popping out to me that have been really dedicating themselves to, you know, certain things. Um, but I realized that if I can just have a podcast that will give people the opportunity to drop those names, you know what I mean? Because when we're talking, people will say, Oh yeah, remember so-and-so or Bill Elliott and this person and that person, whatever. And they're all these people are, they're important parts of the, the history, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if I could just do a podcast and let people roll, they can get out their buddies. Oh yeah. I had this buddy. So-and-so remember this guy, remember that guy, right. then the story could be built even more and I can get more shine on more people's names. Right. Well, cause you're kind of limited a little bit with Instagram and yeah. that's all that it was. But again, you're able to actually listen and hear the stories from the actual people. Like you, you've done such a good job at, collecting the story so far with the photographs and whatnot, but, but to hear it in, you know, real time, like, I think it's pretty powerful, you know, yeah. and I, I think I, you, you're a good storyteller, you're a good listener. And so, you know, I think, I think that you'll definitely add some value to, to those types of situations, you know? Yeah. So. Well, and, and to add on to that is, you know, the other reason of doing Cleveland skateboarding is for, you know, just to get these stories down in the his, you know, the history it's down, right? Yep. It's and and um, for the people that have been around forever, for the skater that just started skating last week, to look and go, oh wow, there's all these people that came from this cult subculture that I'm a part of now. Mm -hmm. To the people that they may not start skating for ten years, you know what I mean? Right. They now we. I, I just want to make a blueprint. Like that's all I'm trying to do is make a blueprint, shine the light on people, get our stories down before we're all gone. And then maybe a future generation can look back, take all, take the, the blueprint I've made and maybe do something better with it. You know? Right. Right. Is there anybody not to give anything away, but is there, I mean, is there a wish list of people that you've got then stories that you want to tell or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've always tried really hard to cover all the generations. Yep. And I think that's been really great because I get so many of the old skaters. They're so psyched that, you know, they're being thought of. Um, But the young skaters are so psyched because they didn't know the stories of these old skaters. They had no idea so-and-so did this or did that. And then at the same time, I want to make sure people see that there's a whole new generation that is doing so many great things. Right. And it's cool because now the older generations are seeing like, oh, wow, like, I thought it was just dead. But wow, there's there's all these kids doing this and doing that. So and then everybody in the middle. Right. So I've always tried to make it a point to really cover as many generations as possible mm -hmm. so everybody can, you know, you know, see what everybody else has been doing, but going into the podcast, I will say that I'm going to right out of the gate. I really want to focus on a lot of the older people, right. you know, because we're all getting old and I got to get these stories down before more of us keep disappearing. Right. right. Exactly. So I really want to get, there's a lot of, a lot of the older skaters. I want to get their stories first. Right. So, um, so yeah. I mean, there's a lot of names that go along with that, but, and, and the other thing you, I have to take into consideration is not everybody knows how to talk. You know what I mean? So yeah. there are yeah. some people that are better storytellers than others. So you don't want to get a, someone on a podcast that only says 10 words, you know, 
yeah but that's but that's kind of endearing to that like that that that'll still work it'll still come across because the cool thing about one cool thing about skateboarding to me has always been the mystery of it yeah and i think that that'll be really interesting to to hear all of that again the way people tell the stories the way people remember the stories because the stories i'm sure some of them you know, you and I were at certain places together, but we, we remember things a little differently sometimes. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just really cool to, to, you know, to hear all of that. And I, yeah. I think it'll really, really, really uh, resonate with people that aren't even from this area because that's the thread that ties yeah. us all together. You know, people are like, Oh wait, that's kind of how it was in my scene too, man. Like, yeah. That was, there was a dude that was just like that guy that was, yeah. you know, and that's, that's what well, tell dude. you about skateboarding what's really cool about this is this instagram i see who's following it and there's a lot of people not from ohio following it there are people around the country following it i i know there are people in england following it there are people nice. in australia following it they're not even from cleveland and they're following it right yeah. and then i did an interview on uh talking schmidt podcast where we talked about me getting this podcast going and since i did that interview i get people messaging me from other states, other places. And they're like, man, that sounds so cool. I'm from wherever I'm from New Jersey or whatever, but I would love to listen to a podcast about skateboarding skateboarders in Cleveland. And I'm like, that is so cool. I, I, I mean, I figured I was like, well, okay, doing this, like my audience isn't going to be very big. It's just going to be people that are interested in skateboarding in Cleveland, but it's really surprising how many people not from Cleveland are already following the Instagram page. So right. it's cool. No, I, I, again, I think it's great. I think it's, I think it's really it's just, people are going to be into it and, you know, you, there could, there, you're a good person to do it. You're, you're probably the person to do it. So, you know, well, cause you can, you can connect the old and the young, like you were saying, like, it's all, it's all there. So, um, well, so when's, when do you think that w what's next then? Like, what are you going to do? Like, so people can know when to tune in to. Well, or what are you thinking? Not to put you on the spot, but what, what's your plans? Well, when we're done doing this, hopefully all goes well and I hit stop and all this gets saved and I have to figure out how to do I'm very technologically challenged. That's why this has taken so long. Um, but if all this goes well, hopefully this goes up soon. And after that, um, I'm hoping to do a podcast or two every month. Oh, wow. That's my goal. That's my okay. goal. Good. So. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So we shall see. All right. Well, so, yeah. anything else you want to talk about? Or you're not um, questions, but if there's anything else you want to, you know. Let me check my notes, Jay. I did make, remember, I sent some of those notes yeah. to you. Let's see here. Yeah. I think we covered this. I know. We covered that. that. Yeah. Um, oh, I want to just talk about like, um, yeah, just my whole um you know, why I'm doing this, I think goes back to ever since I became a sponsored skater, I've always been trying to somehow carry Cleveland yep. with me, you know, from, you know, helping different skaters from Cleveland move to California. I've helped skaters get jobs in the industry. I've always made it a point to try to come back and film video parts in Cleveland, try to shoot photos in Cleveland, help getting contests and pro demos in Cleveland. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It, like I, when I moved away from Cleveland and, and by the way, right now I'm, I'm living back here right now. I've been kind of doing a, like you said, a bi-coastal thing. Um, it's, I don't know. There's something about it. I just, I never just became sponsored turn pro left Cleveland and never looked back. I was never that guy. You know what I mean? I've always wanted to, I always want to rep Cleveland always, you know? So so yeah, this, this whole Cleveland skateboarding is that it, it's just like, of that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's interesting in, in hearing you say that I can think of, cause, cause I think you're absolutely right. But like immediately I thought of Drew Carey, the you know, the comedian yeah. that's from like that dude always carried Cleveland with him too. And, yeah. and I think there's something about the people in this area, skateboarders and for sure that, we're always like, yeah, man, I'm from Ohio, like, or I'm from, you know, and I'm from Cleveland or whatever. It's just, there's a little bit of an edge. Yeah. A little bit of a chip on the shoulder. Yeah. Yes, there is. 
and that's okay. Yeah, for sure. And again, it's just, this is your continuing of that chip on your shoulder. This is you with that edge being like, nah, this is what, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Because I, I'm from Cleveland, man. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm proud of it, man. And of course. it's, it's, I don't think most people, I think people are proud of where they're from, but I don't think people outside of Ohio rep Ohio as much. I don't yeah. know why that is. Yeah. I mean, but people always are like, Oh no, yeah, I'm from Ohio, man. People don't say, Oh yeah, I'm from Kansas. And yeah. People, people don't yeah. say that, you know? Well, there's something about Cleveland, man. I think it's just like, you know, for a lot of us in the Cleveland area, steel mill, uh, it's, it's just a rough town. Like Cleveland's been through a lot of ups and downs. Like when I left Cleveland in the nineties, it was rough. Skating downtown was rough. It's not like it is now, but I, um, I mean, I've lived in San Diego for 25 years and I love San Diego. I love Cle I, I, California as well. I love, I love them all, I do too. but I've never claimed anybody can watch anything in my career over the years. I've never I've never, I love California. I love oceans. I love San Diego. I love LA. I've never claimed it. Never. I, even though I've been there probably as a skater, I've been living there as a skater longer than I was living here as a skateboarder. Right. But Cleveland is what I, that's my, that's what I love. And, and even be, beyond skating, it's like my ancestors are from Cleveland. Yeah. My great grandma and great grandpa are buried off of Harvard. My grandpa worked downtown my other grandpa worked at the steel mills. So when I go around Cleveland, I think about my ancestors. I think about my friends. I, I think about a lot of history. When I see photos of Cleveland from like the turn of the century where there's horses and buggies and stuff down in public square, I look at those photos and I, I think like, I wonder if my great grandparents are in that photo. You know, I, I, it it goes deep with me, you know. My whole family is is from this area, so I love it in so many ways outside of skateboarding. But me being a skateboarder, especially growing up skating the streets of downtown Cleveland so much, I I feel like I have so much history invested into those streets, the same streets that my great grandparents were probably walking down one day, like past a horse, you know. <laughs> right. right. No, not. And when I look at when I look at those steel mills, I think of my grandpa. I think of my friends. Yep. You know what I mean. I think about them working in those mills all these years. I, I don't know. I have a. I just. And when you grow up in an area like that, that's just. Sometimes I think from my era growing up in Cleveland, you, you tend to feel like there's not a lot of hope for maybe a kid like me. Yep. And. I don't know. It 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 could wreck you, or it could give you build you know some use some strong character. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think it, I think it gave you plenty of strong character, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, Thanks, I really, Jay. I, Thanks, I think, Jay. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. So, but, um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty is good. Is that it? Is that, is that the first episode? I, it's, it's, hey, it sounds pretty right. good to me. All right. I like it. Now we have to pray that all this saves on my computer and, uh, my wife can help me figure out how to edit it and get it on a podcast thing. And I'm going to have it on my YouTube channel. By the way, it's going to be on, I'm just keeping it on my Christian Svitek YouTube channel. I'm going to make its own little playlist. It's going to be Cleveland skateboarding storytellers. That's okay. what it's going to be labeled as just because I already have an audience built. It's just, it's easier yeah. oh, to yeah, just nice. make it that way. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, this all goes smooth. And if all this goes well, I'm excited to start calling some other people and getting it going. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to hear. I think it's going to be, you know, again, knowing the stories, living the stories, being a part of some of the stories, like it's it's just going to be really great visiting, visiting that again. And because like you, and I think like most people from this area, we're really into our history, and I think yeah. you're going to really, really do it justice. So. You know. I hope so, Jay. I'm going to try my best. <laughs> All righty. Well, I think that's good. So you want to wrap it up? I guess that's it. Um, that is it. Thanks yeah. for listening, everybody. And um, I'll keep you posted on the Instagram when the next episode is coming. And now I am going to hit the stop button. So oh, stay, wow. stay tuned. And uh Hope to see you guys all out there skating at some point. All right.
Goodbye. Goodbye.